Okay, I think we're live, everyone. It says live and recording, so it's 9.30, spot on the hour. We're good in Swiss time. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Um, for those of you joining us today, we have an illuminary panel here, uh, four uh, colleagues that um, are really coming from different parts of the world. Um, first, I'll introduce myself. My name is Catherine Cunningham. And I'm a, a media entrepreneur that uh, works in the sustainable development space, uh, climate change, and works essentially for organizations or with organizations like Harassis to help define ways forward um, in meeting our sustainable development goals, um, cli meeting climate change, and looking at um, nature-based solutions. Um, so that inspire different stakeholders uh, to protect and preserve this beautiful planet we live on. So that's myself. I'll move to then um, Mike um, Furick, who is CEO and founder of Allison. He is joining us from Galway, Ireland. He's a Harvard grad entrepreneur, creating and developing different uh, scalable ways for free education to roll the roost. Um, looking at ways that businesses can engage uh, in uh, developing uh, different means to empower their, uh, their workforce. Um, he is quite, uh, has quite a, a history in developing open online courses behind the, the mocks, the mix of open online courses. He's currently running Allison. It's a free education platform. I'm sure he's going to tell us all about how he's going to move from his 1 million uh, educate, educated online to a billion over the next century. Um, was former CEO and founder of Yak TV Media, working for Microsoft and developing e-learning content. So Mike is here joining us. Then we have Jeff Dean, who is a Google Senior Fellow, um, SVP of Google Research and Health. Um, welcome, Dean, uh, a um, stellar computer scientist that uh, has been behind a lot of the mechanics and uh, algorithms of Google's enterprise, working first in the 80 surf systems, 80 cents for content, or ad cents for content, so um, developing those smart systems for linking people's preferences with, um, yeah, the, the, the content that they're they're looking for bringing in the, the advertising. Um, Google Spanner, he's definitely a tool builder and a system scientist thinking big and uh, worked behind also the Google Translate, I think, but now um, uh, working on a number of Google's um, health and education efforts. So welcome, Jeff. And then we have um, Monica Marshall, who's a managing partner of Ruder Finn. She's joining us from Washington, D.C. Um, she's been working with the UN um, on a number of different initiatives, marketing, communications, and economic development, trade, tourism. Uh, has worked in disaster relief, looked at food chains, food nutrition, uh, I think also with Ketchum and uh, the FAO, right? Uh, worked quite a bit on nutrition and food security. So she's joining us from D.C. We're happy to have her. And then finally, and I hope that she can hop on with us. She's joining us from Rome, um, and her name is Giulia Di Tommaso. She's the president and CEO of Crop Life International. She's a lawyer by training, worked in e um, European law, always engaged and passionate about um, advancing innovation agriculture uh, and moving toward those, those SDG goals of zero hunger and um, nature-based solutions in agriculture. So Julia, when you can join us, oh, there she is, she's on again. Um, welcome. So that is our- Yeah, uh, Catherine, uh, I'm uh, trying hard to get online, unfortunately. Yes. Well, you just join us as you can. And, and since we can hear you now, maybe, Julia, are you there? Why don't you lead us out with your headlines on um, what's important from CropLife's perspective 
um, when it comes to um, economic opportunities and uh, marrying that with the, the SDG goals, what are some um, opportunities that you can see? Oh, that she just dropped us. Okay, so let me push this question over to maybe Monica to frame it for us. As you're looking at the SDGs, I think we'll focus on, because the expertise at the table, education, agriculture, and innovation, maybe get to some of the health uh, issues and concerns with Jeff's contributions as well. But um, why don't you lead us out, Monica, and offer us some thoughts on how businesses can benefit from being part of the, the SDG um, or meeting meeting these SDG goals, sort of joining that um, nation or NDC conversation. Um, sure. Because I know for you, sure. private, private partnerships are important. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, yes, I think collaboration um, across industry and with industry, across you know government and with NGOs is really critical. I mean, we've learned a lot in the since 2000 when. Um, Kofi Annan kicked off the MDCs, um, uh, Millennial Development Goals, MDGs, I should say, and then it shifted into the SDGs. Um, so what I really like about the Sustainable Development Goals is that it's very inclusive. Um, they reach, they are targeting everybody in every country. And this is not to say that the MDCs were not, but it was very specifically focused on the lesser developed countries. And so that gives a whole opportunity for anybody at any level to contribute in their own way. Um, and so, you know, we understand that governments bear the majority of the um, responsibility to understand what the needs are in their countries and, and you know, develop solutions, whether that's healthcare or education, or we've talked about food security or any number of issues. But they cannot do it alone. They need private sector. They need the thinking from the private sector, the innovation, the speed. They need the private sector to push. Um, but the private sector also needs the government because there's, you know, the, the governments have access to you know, the whole population to the people, et cetera. And so they, they, that this relationship between the public and the private, I think is really critical. And the only way for us to one, identify truly what the issues are in priority order and then solve those issues. So I'm excited about today because we can talk about, we've got a nice mix of, um, of uh, expertise here to talk about how we, you know, how we can come together, what's worked, what hasn't worked um, and really, you know, try to make progress towards um, addressing some of these important SDGs. Absolutely, excellent. Well, of course, um, in this new digital environment that we live in and obviously are interacting in here, we have an opportunity to think more globally, to have that a greater interface with developing countries and create new opportunities. So maybe Jeff, why don't you pick up from there and share with us some of your headlines from for this session today? Um, and what what you see as the economic benefits sort of as a response to what Monica was just sharing. Sure, sure. I'd be delighted. Uh, uh, thank you for having me. Thanks to the organizers for putting this together. And Catherine, thank you for moderating. Uh, I'm really excited for the conversation. Uh, so I'm Jeff, and I lead Google's AI and health research efforts. Uh, and our work includes uh, research and advanced mm -hmm. development that makes product Google's products more helpful to people all over the world but also fundamental research to advance the field of AI and other technologies and applied projects that really harness that technology to tackle some of the societal issues we see all around the world. Um, the question of how to reach the sustainable development goals really is important to me, uh, especially if we can apply technology to, to help, help us in reaching some of these goals. I think it's a really great opportunity and there's many ways in which we can, we can do that. Um, as a child, I had the, the, a uh, delightful opportunity to live in many places all over the world. So I went to 11 schools in 12 years, including living in rural Uganda and the Somali refugee camp for some time. And I worked for the World Health Organization uh, on the uh, little program on AIDS uh, just after college. And so I, I've seen how, um, you know, uh, international organizations like the UN, other organizations can really come together to really help people in, in time to need. And the uh, development goals are really great ones in that re regard. In the decades since I was at WHO, though, right. I've been amazed to see 
how much progress we've made on these issues. And it's remarkable how much technology has really helped us. So, uh, you know, advances in agricultural yields in, you know, better healthcare, the vaccine technology that we've all uh, benefited from recently, or many of us have, uh, and the fact that well over the half the world now has a smartphone in their pocket. So as head of a research org that is focused on AI, I'm especially focused on how we can, you know, apply these technologies in service of the goals. And we're seeing particularly exciting uh, applications that I can talk about a little bit later. Uh, specific use cases like flood forecasting, disease detection, agriculture, crisis response. And, uh, you know, I think these are going to be great conversation topics. And I'm really excited to hear more from uh, Mike, Monica, and Julia as well. Brilliant. Well, thank you for that introduction. And actually, I'm glad that you'll focus on the, the AI benefits and innovation technology for advancing new op economic opportunities and obviously meeting some of our healthcare education needs. Um, because I know in, in some regards, people think AI, artificial intelligence, oh, that's taking away the job sphere. This is, you know, somehow, um, uh, what would you say, replacing human, the human workforce. But actually, I'd love to have you focus on how that, you know, flip that narrative, how in fact innovation in that space actually helps us become in different in the energy, agriculture, health sectors, become more efficient and um, provides more economic opportunity, let's say. And so that's a perfect segue over to Mike um, as well, because of course, with this digital, um, with this digital capacity and, and global smartphones ubiquitous, then there's an opportunity for developing content that helps educate people into these, uh, into what they're passionate about in, edu in uh, health and agriculture potentially. So, Mike, why don't you share with us some of your thoughts that you'd like to um, amplify to more this this harass this audience and and how you can actually use, love your, you can actually tailor your education resources in governments to enhance this new uh, workforce and bring free education to the world. Why don't you share with us your thoughts there? Okay, well, th thank you, Catherine, and thank you for to Rasis for having us and for chairing it, and thank you for the yes. fellow participants here. I guess th th there's a one-liner that essentially uh, that. That I, I would come up with all the time, and that's uh, education underpins all social progress. So if we can make education free, uh, we can affect every one of the SDGs. And I guess uh, to Monica's point, talking about collaboration, I guess uh, I too have been have uh, had access to large NGOs, but I have to admit that I'm very frustrated with uh, a lot of the dynamic that I see with NGOs. It's just not happening quick enough. And I'd be more on Jeff's side of just saying technology can be hugely, hugely, hugely and be the factor that can change the world in, in regards to SDGs. So uh, how Alison, I guess I, I need to tell the story just about Alison, because that's the tool that I'm using to try and change the world. It's um, it, by the way, sits on a lot of Google uh, technology. So mm -hmm. Jeff and his colleagues are trying to do their things. But uh, you also enable companies like us to do what we do. Uh, so I, I guess the, the thing is, I, I started Allison many years ago as a, as a for-profit social enterprise and with, with a desire to try and make education free to everyone. It's based on an advertising model, which is a la Google helps us with that, and, and freemium model. When people can pay, they do, uh, but they don't have to pay. And we, we've got to some very, I think, significant scale now. Uh, in the last 12 months, graduated 1 million people. And uh, you think of just how many just I, I did. I was just doing some research there earlier, just looking at the, the cost per hour of college in the United States is about a thousand dollars per credit hour. And if you look at how many hours that people spend on Allison, uh, the, the cost for per credit hour in the United States is a thousand dollars. The cost of doing one cre one hour on Allison is about two dollars. So it's 500 times more expensive. And the fact is that you can use by bringing in AI and bringing in all sorts of technologies and platforms, we can utterly transform uh, ed the education in the pl on the planet, make education at all levels completely free to people in every language, at every level. And we're proving it because, you know, we, we, we're doing it uh, and we're profitable. So how is it that we can, you know, graduate a million people 
and and make a profit doing it and charge essentially no one. There's actually about 12% of people pay in any way on the Allison platform, 88% don't at all. And we're very uh, focused on on developing markets. And one of the, the exciting parts of that is actually people don't realize that only 8% of the world have ever gone to college. 92% haven't. And okay, that includes old, older people and, and younger children. But the essential thing is we have a huge talent crunch right across the world right now. But the truth, we're, we're looking in a very small pool. Who, who's to say that the smartest people in the world are in the 8% that have gone to college? Well, pro- statistically, it would suggest that they're not <laughs> in it, right? But how, how do we engage those people that cannot afford to go to classic college or spend the years in it or afford in a traditional way? So I, I think that what Alison is doing is breaking that barrier. And I have a lot to say on that. But just, I guess what I want, you know, my reason of, of going into forums like this is saying, you know what, we have the possibility of providing education to everyone for free in every language at every level via the net. And OK, we can't be the empathetic teacher that will sit down with the child on their knee. But you know what, when once people are 15, 16, 17 and they get into adult learning, then online learning can be quite phenomenal. So uh, maybe I'll just leave it at that for once and just say we have something that's working and I think the world should take notice. And I guess going back to the collaboration point Monica making, I guess I get frustrated. So my mission is just to go do it ourselves and, and not necessarily look to anybody, but rely on technology to, 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 be, the, to be the engine. And I would say too, your, your service, your offering and education, free education online is additive to other educational opportunities as well out there. So, and it seems like your focus is on um, more, you know, the after formal education after 18 years to help train people or identify purpose, vision, passion and then really tailor education from what I can see with your work to where people can be most effective and be most happy working in a society. And so a huge value opportunity there, especially as a lot of um, jobs will be d- displaced or workforce yeah. disrupted in some ways. So new educational opportunities yeah. um, are really- yeah. Can I, can I add a point, like Catherine? That. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, just the point of people look like platforms to learn what knowledge we have. But a lot of the challenges that we have in SDGs are trying to take a crack at problems that we don't really know the solutions of, including climate change. So, you know, I read with interest Bill Gates's recent book on, you know, how to defeat climate change. And one thing that stunned me after finishing it was he didn't talk about the power of free learning to to accelerate the understanding and innovation. Because if people know quicker what people are coming up with and have greater insight more quickly with what actually people have found out, then actually change can happen much quicker. So what we're doing is, okay, we're, we're teaching people, you know, mo- most of what people learn in the world is the same thing. You know, if you look at all the subjects that people study in college, it's actually a very narrow band of what people uh, learn in the world. But... Um, but if you can accelerate learning by those people that are pushing the boundaries and make that more rapidly available to people, then actually we can make intense progress on some of these SDGs. The problem is the profit motive. You know, how, how can, like Bill Gates' solution is give it to private companies and they'll do it. My answer is that's not quick enough. Uh, we, we, need to share, we need to share knowledge quicker and a, and a system like Allison can potentially do that. Okay. Beautiful. Well, actually, and then I want to jump to Julia because I see that she's back online again. But um, exciting is that as we, as the innovation curve sort of exponentially increases, what holds us back in getting to some of the difficulties of reading the SDGs is ad- adoption. And so maybe learning also for adoption of innovation, that would be something I'd, I'd love to really uh, focus on in this panel as well. And I think we can even use the agricultural sector and, and shift over to Julia and, and have her give a, a, a few words on what she thinks are important to discuss as far as innovation in agriculture and how um, maybe even touch on, you know, how education can help with a- adoption of new agricultural practices, sharing of knowledge among farmers, um, gaining greater understanding of how um, 
we can be more efficient in um, agricultural production, um, whether you're a farm or just a community member that's needing to ad adopt um, or adapt to new, new innovations in agriculture. Yeah. Um, maybe Julia, could you pop yeah, in yeah. and share with us some thoughts on that? of education well thank you so life. much and thanks and i would say apologies uh, first of all apologies was my lovely con uh, education more connection better connections in italy and <laughs> definitely will be needed but uh you know very very delighted to to join a bit with you today um have this uh, important discussion um, and, and you mentioned education i wanted to if you allow me also to go back to your uh, uh, earlier question so how how we can achieve the sustainable development goals, and particularly the role of agriculture, the role of innovation agriculture. So uh, I think particularly in these tough times, how the sustainable development goals uh, are anchored in uh, uh, fundamentals of protecting, uh, you know, economic and social rights, the rights of the individuals, and in agriculture, the SDGs uh, uh, act as a compass uh, for, for, our, for us to, to help us to navigate uh, all these uh, choices. Um, so I, I think it's, it's, it's very important from uh, our perspective when we address these uh, challenges and the SDGs-led ambitions, uh, of which education is a fundamental part, as we said, that also we recognize that we cannot do it alone. We, knew, we, we also need new way of uh, collaborations, uh, new, new partnerships. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we also need new, new how we can nurture innovations mm -hmm. and how we can nurture new technologies and digital transformation, uh, particularly critical in, uh, in order to drive more sustainable food systems and also how we, mm -hmm. we share knowledge, we, we, we pro provide access to knowledge and we empower and bring the local communities uh, uh, with us. So I, I think this, uh, uh, as you said earlier, this um, how we can uh, foster the partnership and collaborations is uh, really at the heart of the strategy of Crop Life International. Uh, um, and we, we really ground the work on the uh, sharing knowledge, engagement and transparency. And currently we have over 300 individual partnerships uh, on the ground around access to knowledge on uh, on, uh, on, on technologies around the agriculture, sustainable practices. Um, so uh, another, another component very well, important Julia. is how we can, yeah. Well, I was just, I was just gonna say, if I can stop you there, because I think what could be really interesting also for our audience would be to understand like very tangible, let's ground this, this innovative, um, these new technologies that help farmers share knowledge. Let's ground this in a real example. Can you give us um, a, a place that you're working with CropLife where you're helping farmers share new information about an agricultural technology that um, is helping create more efficiency in, agri in production? Can you give us an example and then maybe a challenge that you have in that environment, and maybe it's even just as simple as the connectivity, because here you're sitting in, in Rome and the connectivity is difficult for, for you, and I'm living in a rural environment, Mike's in a rural environment as well in Galway, and so you know the, the connectivity issue is, is something that is also important to address, and maybe Jeff can give us some ideas about how um, how we might um, how we might be advancing in, in that arena of connectivity, but can you can you give us an example of of something that you're working on at Crop Life and imagine us as the collaborative team that are helping you move beyond your difficult touch points. Yeah, uh, one one of the uh, uh, examples. Did we lose you, Julia. Uh, 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 can you hear me? Still okay. <laughs> 
Okay, I try. Good. <laughs> so yeah. one of the examples, uh, in fact, uh, uh, is, uh, you know, uh, or, uh, concrete examples of collaborations on the ground to address uh, these challenges. For instance, uh, working with FAO and how we can work together um, on the ground with the teams, with the farmers uh, to the, reduce the effects of pests, the pests that such as for the for, for instance the full army worm pests, which are affecting countries in in Africa, and this uh, these diseases plant diseases is uh, spreading at a speed unbelievable speed of two hundred kilometers uh, per hour, and and this fall, fall army worm can have ha, he's having already a devastating impact on farmers' livelihoods and affects really severely the 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 local communities on the ground. So so uh, this is an example of how working with FAO and working with uh, uh, the local the local uh, organizations, the NGOs on the ground, we are looking into um, uh, several solutions, uh, new solutions, uh, including new products, biological um, um, uh, integrated solution, integrated approach that combines various solutions on the ground to address this kind of diseases. Um, another example, for instance, which is uh, uh, it's a the the efforts uh, to drastically reduce the uh, the the plastic containers uh, on the ground that uh, in a in a in a supply chain uh, um, results in you know removing millions of tons of plastic plastic uh, containers from the environment. This is uh, this is uh, the result of a joint efforts. Uh, with governments uh, and local organizations and local communities on the ground. So um, other examples regards, for instance, uh, cooperating with a development agency like uh, GIZ or USAID on the ground, really uh, identify integrated solutions and uh, providing um, uh, technical and uh, innovative solutions to farmers in, in order to address some of these diseases that they are really catastrophic considering also post-COVID uh, uh, post uh, situation. So, um, yeah, I will stop here. <laughs> I will have uh, uh, other examples to share, but it's uh, it's really this uh, cooperation between... Well, I think, I think you've got many, and there are few... <laughs> Yeah, I think it's important, Catherine, to your earlier point, how we can define new ways yes, of cooperating the cooperation together. between the technical yes. experiences. Yes. Yeah, and new, and new ways, new approach, innovative ways to, to approach Beautiful. things. So well, where innovation so much is not giving us some, some yes. Right, perfect. So what I hear with these early warning detection systems for pests and disease is that you can essentially inform farmers sort of ahead of the ahead of the locust plague or so to then prepare themselves and their land so you don't lose crops year to year. So there's something about early detection warning systems that can be put in place in an environment. Um, innovation and con conversation. Um, so when you link different, let's say the farming community, when you link different farmers, they can share intelligence as well. Um, and then surveillance in a sense on the ground with plastic containers, you know, understanding where they're concentrated. Oops. Are we back? Yeah. You're back. Yes. back. Perfect. Okay. Back. I don't know where you lost me, but I was leading to Jeff because we wanted, oh. if, if you would, Jeff, to illuminate yeah. for us or illustrate for us maybe other ideas of where um, or to pick up on what Julie was suggesting with early warning detection systems um, that, that AI can help uh, uh, enhance 
um, if we're looking yeah. at you know other natural disasters, um, and then perhaps the surveillance um, uh, aspects, how AI can help in. I'm thinking not just on on land yeah. with with waste, but also in the farming or the fishing community, surveillance of illegal fishing, something like this. If you could um, illustrate for us yeah, let me, how AI can help serve. Yeah, let me let me uh, talk about a couple of different projects. One in flood forecasting, and one in a health related thing of assessing diabetic retinopathy. Uh, I think they tie together a number of the different uh, SDG goals. And one of them that's really important is partnership. So often when we're working in some of these spaces, we um, kind of look at a problem and see how we can apply technology to tackle uh, that problem. And so one of the areas we've been looking in for, for about four or five years now is how can we develop better uh, models of how flooding will occur when there are heavy rainfalls in various areas that are especially prone to flooding. Um, and so in partnership with the Indian government, we initially started out uh, modeling some uh, relatively small portions of India and getting assessments of how well our models were behaving and predicting compared to other models. And one of the nice properties that these machine learning based models have is that they're actually able to much more accurately give really detailed fine-grained information about where is going to uh, where is flooding going to occur not just like these many square kilometers are going to be flooded but like literally this part of this village is going to be flooded and you better get to higher ground um and so we've been working in partnership with the indian government and now more recently the bangladeshi government as well to roll this out to wider and wider regions of coverage and we now have coverage uh of an area with more than 360 million people. Uh, and we can actually give fine-grained alerts to people's phones, uh, one of the nice properties of, of many, many people having having access to uh, the internet and to phones. Um, and we sent out 115 million alerts last year, for example. Um, this is an example of a small project started in a research effort, expanding in partnership with initially the India government and now the Bangladeshi government, and really now has a pretty broad impact across India, Bangladesh, and we're expanding to other areas that are also prone to flooding. Um, similarly, uh, another problem we looked at was um, the kind of diagnosis of diabetic retinopathy, which is a, a eye disease that is a side effect of um, diabetes. And it's actually a really unfortunate condition. There's probably 400 million people at risk of this condition around the world. Um, and really people who are at risk should get screened every year, but there aren't enough ophthalmologists to actually screen people in many, many parts of the world. And if you catch this disease in time, it's actually very treatable. Uh, but if you don't catch it in time, then people suffer full or partial vision loss. And so it's really a, a tragedy that we don't have the capabilities to screen everyone who, who should be screened. And so one of the things that AI can really help with is by emulating the process that trained ophthalmologists and even retinal, uh, retinal specialists go through in diagnosing a retinal image, we can actually use machine learning to do that diagnosis as effectively or even better than board certified ophthalmologists in the United States, and then deploy that in many different regions to increase the ability of us to screen everyone who needs screening. And so to date, with and now we've expanded to working with the Thai government as well as uh, France and Germany. And we've screened more than 100,000 patients. Where partnership is a vital piece, technology is a vital piece, and helps us work towards some of the sustainable goals around improving healthcare and access to healthcare. That's excellent. Oh, I'll pause there. Beautiful. Jeff, um, I think you're a little bit delayed. So maybe if you stop your video just for for one second or maybe, you, yeah, come back on. Um, with the flooding, thank you so much for these examples, too, because it's they're perfect pivots to different people in our in our um, in our panel. If I look to you, Mike, and we 
um, take that first flooding example, or maybe also um, Julia's crop life example of the disease, it feels like the disease prevention, um, it feels like there's, there's definitely an education element to this as well. They've got the early warning detection systems in place, so people get the alerts or whether the farmers or people in a dangerous flood zone. But then, you know, what to do with that and how to prepare yourself for these hazards and maybe how to um, contribute to, you know, a cleanup or a solution, which is also potentially a new job opportunity. Maybe you can you can speak to that and the importance of education intermixing with these early detection warning systems. Yeah, I, two points to make, really. Uh, one is Mike, just following up on Jeff. Yes. Can you hear me? Right. Yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Jeff? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, okay. I can. Okay. No, just uh, following up on Jeff's point about the smartphone. It, 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 okay, it is the phenomenal. Again, uh, okay. It is the nuclear uh, solution here. You know, half the world have smartphones. Um, and, and then you have the likes of. You know, one interesting thing, Geo in India at the moment has has a two gigabit, gigabit download per day for four dollars a month. Right. And you just put that in context. The poorest country in the world, by according to the United Nations, is Burundi. They have a six hundred and fifty million dollar or six hundred and fifty dollars a year income. The, even the poorest people in the world can probably afford to keep a smartphone at four dollars a month. OK, so and uh, even with Alison, 65 percent of people who learn on Alison uh, learn on a smartphone. So smartphones is a huge equitable tool and it can bypass systems of education, whether it's, you know, that's one thing we find. We've nearly 600,000 people in Nigeria that uh, follow Alison uh, avidly and we never talk to the Department of Education. We have millions of people online in India. We never talk to the Department of Education. So the smartphone is a direct way of getting to the, even the poorest to educate them. But going back to the agricultural uh, point of view and the flooding, I think that one concept that we have at Allison is uh, everyone a learner, everyone a teacher. So uh, on Allison, uh, we have free self-publishing. So not only can you go on and complete a course for free, but you can also create your own course. So when you talk about a farmer who knows about, who is in Ethiopia, who knows how to grow a particular crop, and that's his expertise, then he should be creating courses on it and telling everybody else. And uh, the very fact that everyone is alert, this is the change of society today. I think it's one of the biggest changes in, in civilization is that in, in, in history, we've all been learners from small numbers of people. But today, everyone can teach everyone else. And we have to create the systems that allow that, that flow of information to, to, to happen seamlessly. And if we can, we can enormously impact the prosperity of the world and peace and all of those good things, right? But uh, it just quite simply, you know, everyone, everyone a learner, everyone a teacher. So uh, again, if, if you have crops or there's local knowledge, you know, uh, as Jeff can, can use AI and all of that to do the, the big macro stuff on flooding. But then if everybody who knew everything, uh, anything about flooding was able to input into that system as well and get the local knowledge, then that would be phenomenal. So you can do the big crunching in AI and that's, and it's amazing what we can do today. But if you can hook in at the same time with the micro local knowledge, then we have amazing solutions. So education, again, underpinning that. I think, I think this is important, some very important Brilliant. point comes... that Mike, Mike is making, uh, resonates with Jeff and Monica, Great. because I think this also uh, confirms the need to have a, a forward-thinking outlook in terms of collaboration. See, I think we, we need uh, for unprecedented challenges a, a totally different way to look at collaboration and actions together. So it's not a traditional uh, way to come together. See, what Mike and Jeff and Monica are, are really reflecting the need for a totally different mindset on collaborations so that they are truly transformative. Uh, they bring all the different voices uh, together. Yeah, and I completely concur with you, Julia. What I, I love the discussion around the role of technology, and I do That's like right. the discussion and it's also Mike, around... not one way. way. Oh. Sorry, I, I don't know if I'm delayed, but <laughs> about the democratization of education is basically what you're talking about. 
I think what's really important for us to really, if we go back to the, the topic of this, is how do we how do we achieve the SDGs? It's building capacity at every level. So I think technology has a role, but so do does this collaboration to build that capacity. Um, and that's how we're going to eventually be able to solve these global challenges. Absolutely. Yeah, very, very, very good point, uh, Monica. Brian, Can I add a point, um, Catherine? Monica, I was just... Okay. I think there is a little delay. I'm so sorry. Absolutely. I wanted to just, before we jump in, I wanted to actually go to Monica and ask her just briefly, if you could touch on your point, Mike, that was brilliantly made on smartphones. And since you've been working with the UN and different organizations within the UN, how do you think we can actually get with the ITU and other UN organizations to this, you know, universal coverage because it's access to smartphones and then obviously having that interconnectivity. What do you think are some of the key leverage points? And I'm aware that we've only got a few minutes left, then we'll, we'll sort of, Maybe this comment quick, and then Micah, a quick comment, and then maybe a summary point from us all. Go ahead, Monica. Yeah, I mean, the UN is a massive organization, and it's quite... Monica, can you hear? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. The UN is a big organization, very bureaucratic. I, I think, you know, it's... it's yeah. I don't know in the short term how that can come together, but... Um, I do think just uh, the UN itself is looking at ways to reorganize so that they can collaborate. But right now it's it's quite siloed and there's nothing like a crisis uh, to bring, you know, organizations together. So I, I just think we have to um, create practical, tactical solutions. I think we get caught up in talking up here and don't get down on the ground in the practical, tactical. So I don't know. You're. I can't tell if you guys can hear me or not because okay. Catherine is okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> A little bit delayed. All right. Okay. Yeah. I think she wants us to give two seconds. <laughs> yes. You Mike, why don't, why don't you start and then add your, your last point that you wanted to make? And just, yeah, this is, just I guess, a phone. Yeah. The, well, yeah the, the last point is that. What? I was just going to say something. Is starting... Technology. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have a one gig line here. It's not my issue. <laughs> Any case, no. I guess the point I wanted to make is that even with what Jeff is saying and what I'm saying from the flat, uh, for, from the technology point of view, is that you know, well, what can we do about it? Okay. One of the big problems we have in the world is that we have this hang-up about formal education. Is that people need to be four years at a college to actually be told, you know, for us to believe that they know something about something. And actually, technology has run way past that. You know, on Allison, for instance, you can study whatever you want for free. We do free psychometric testing. So it's verbal reasoning, numeracy, abstract reasoning. You can go find out where your aptitudes are. You can figure out what your job is. And it doesn't cost you anything. And we can match you to jobs for free. Right. So it's just a, is that governments as a whole need to understand that the real energy of the world is in, is coming in informal learning and uh, and that it ha it has to get away from this uh, this 4 trillion dollar business which is formal education which has a, a heavy status quo and has big interests to protect so we need to push informal learning it is much more powerful than formal and anyway we need to start accepting it so that's my point brilliant jeff Jeff, your thoughts to pick up on that final inspirational comments? Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with Mike. Uh, I completely agree with Mike about how there are so many talented people all over the world and sort of looking through the lens of traditional education, which only very few have access to is a, you know, a, a rather myopic view of how do we tap into the world's talent to tackle these really important problems. I think the, you know, the SDGs themselves are, things that are going to require really creative thinking, really unique approaches to make us make progress on them. And they're going to need people from all over the world to come together to really see how can we tackle this problem and that problem, and that problem, and in true partnership, develop solutions that we can all build on. 
And I think this is a, a fine, you know, one of the SDGs is about partnership. And I think partnership comes in forms. It comes in you know, large organizations. As Mike said, uh, you know, individuals sharing their knowledge with other individuals in, in really creative uh, ways and making that scale with technology. I think these are amazing opportunities and together is the only way we're going to make progress on the SDGs. Brilliant. Monica, you want to build on that since that was really Yeah, I, I totally... Yeah, I totally agree. So I spent 10 years inside the UN and 10 years outside of the UN and tons of progress have been made. I think, you know, I hold out a lot of hope, even though many of the most, most of the world is a bit partisan. I also feel like there's this big movement around inclusion. So we think about education and not, you don't have to have a four year degree. I think in the United States, because again, crisis situations create an open mind because you've got to come up with a solution. There's a job crisis, you know, going on and, and you've got the great migration and the great resignation, all this other stuff. It's forcing people to think differently and open their mind to new solutions. So I hold out a lot of hope that that will win in the day and that as we collaborate, we can, you know, really solve some of these big issues. Brilliant. Julia, would you like to share with us your final inspirational note on that concept of partnership and the importance of being the sort of producer, consumer, the learner, the teacher? Thanks, Catherine. Thank you all. I, I would say thanks for this, for providing a platform, a diverse platform to discuss together so important uh, uh, topics, technology, education, agriculture, all the sectors. So the fact that we are together in a very diverse group, uh, so I would say uh, let's do more of this with better connection on my end for sure, but let's do more of these uh, diverse dialogues uh, and that, you know, band all together to share, to achieve a shared ambition. So, so I would say more of this, but also looking forward to seeing you in person <laughs> and, uh, and move forward this uh, partnership approach, uh, hopefully also together. So thank you. Thank you very much. Beautiful. What a wonderful note to end on. Thank you, everyone. We went a minute over. Um, I wasn't ever able to see how we could get to chat questions. I don't know if we had any, but um, I certainly would agree to carry on this conversation. It's a good idea forward. And uh, hopefully you'll join another session through the Harassis uh, U.S. meeting today. I think it goes almost till midnight my time. So there are plenty of opportunities, a very rich program. Um, thanks for joining and um, look forward to speaking soon. Have a beautiful day. Bye, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.